Hello everyone. Whoa. <clears throat> First words that I've spoken this morning. <laughs> um, I need to film a few videos. So we're up. The hair's extra poofy. It's fantastic. We're going to dive in. So we have our weekly wrap up and this may be the like least that I've read in a week, maybe all year. Um, I'm at a little bit of a crunch time with, with work right now, so I haven't even been able to like listen as much as I do. But again, I have been rereading favorites and annotating them. So that's just happening. That being said, I still got through eight books this week. Um, and I'm doing really good with the Romance Takeover Readathon. I only have a couple prompts left to hit, uh, which I kind of like knew was going to happen. Um, also, I did like deviate a little bit because a couple books that I really wanted came out. And so I just went for it and had to have them type of thing. But let's go ahead and dive in with what I read. So the first one that I finished was Lady Be Reckless, which is by Megan Frampton. Um, I think that I hadn't talked about this one before. No, I didn't because I wrapped up. Sorry, my brain's a little frazzled too because it's been, I haven't been able to film all week. I think I shared this in one of my other videos because they had construction. And I think they'll be doing construction today as well. So that's why I like was like, get up early, get started with filming because if they show up, what am I gonna do? But anyway, so this is book two in the Duke's Daughters. And it has a weird naming convention this time because the series is supposed to be the Duke's Daughters and the book is called Lady Be Reckless. But only for this book, they like switched it around, which is kind of confusing. But anyway, um, it's really apropos that I read a Megan Frampton book at the beginning of the week because Megan Frampton um, made me really happy this week on Twitter with some stuff that went down with one of my friends. So I'm happy to be supporting her. But this one is about the second sister, Lady Olivia. Um, this is about um, these group of daughters that like this Duke has five daughters. And the first one was supposed to marry um, this one Duke. And she ended up falling in love with his brother. Well, then this sister thinks that she's in love with that same Duke. And so at the beginning of this book, she proposes to him and he's like, uh, I'm not interested at all. And not only does she get turned down in a really embarrassing way, but the Duke's friend happens to be in the room, like hide, like he was in the room and they didn't notice him. until so he heard everything. And this guy, he's actually a bastard. So he's the bastard of this really wealthy guy. And this guy is dying and so he wants his son to get married and like not be alone but the dude's a bastard so it's gonna be very hard to find someone and even lady olivia she's pretty rude to edward in the beginning because number one he catches her at a really bad moment and number two so she's kind of thrown back but lady olivia she has a bit of a savior complex as in she has a very good heart but she wants to save everyone which can be a really annoying character trait but she gets shown in a few different ways that sometimes the way that you're helping is really condescending. Um, and this gets really shown to her in the way that she treats Edward. But they have this super, super strong attraction to each other. And, you know, things start to progress no matter what. And it's one of those where kind of everybody else wants it to happen. Well, not everybody, because her parents don't want her to be married to a bastard, but like her sisters and actually the um edward his father like wants them to be together and it's really cute so i ended up giving this four stars i listened to it on audio it was really cute next i finished my reread of the takeover by tl swan guys at this point i don't know what else to say about this book we were doing this re this is the book you guys picked to reread with me which i thought you might because you guys know that it's my favorite and so it's been it was fantastic. I cried so much. I laughed so much. I love Tristan. I love Claire. I love the kids. This book is fantastic. Tristan is in my top five heroes I've ever read. There's just something about this book. And I know to some people this book just doesn't have the significance to you that it does to me. There are a few people in the reread that are like, I just don't get the hype. And I was like, to be fair, 
I'm the one hype. Like, it's my hype. So, I mean, this is one of T.L. Swan's top sold books ever. And, you know, I like to take a little credit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I know a lot of people like the stopover better. That's fine. Not everyone likes books with kids. That's fine. I didn't think I liked books with kids because the kids have to be done really well. And in this book, I feel like they are. They're super funny. I listened to this on audio this time, and I will say the voice for Claire, not my favorite um, voice actor for playing an older person, not old, but like Claire's 39, and the voice of the person who does her, um, CJ Bloom, she usually does like college girls. And so it was just a really weird, like I couldn't picture that voice as being Claire, but uh, I loved it. I ugly cried a couple times. And I just love these people so much. They make me so happy. So this was obviously five star. It's a six star. It's fantastic. This is my reread of The Madness of Lordy McKenzie. This was our other buddy read. <laughs> I kind of did both of those right away. Um, this I listened to on Audible as well. It was a little trickier to find because it's actually been removed from Amazon. So I had to go to Jennifer Ashley's website and I downloaded it on Authors Direct, which I already have the app for that. So I paid like $10 to get it. I don't care, I would have paid more um, because I'd listened to the entire rest of the series when I had Audible Escape, but I had already read this one like physically before I started using Audible Escape. But um, this is fantastic. This is about a widow, um, Beth, and she meets Ian McKenzie who very likely has autism or some form of neurodiversity. And number one, he is trying to like, <clears throat> He decides to help her not get married to a rake, basically. But his family has a pretty bad reputation. They are seen as these kind of like encroaching Scottish lords um, because the oldest Mackenzie brother, he's trying to become prime minister and he has a lot of ideas about things. Um, he's very proper, but Ian is just Ian. He likes his Ming pottery and he loves Beth. and. Hearing him call her my Beth and sweet Beth and the way that this man doesn't like to be touched, but when he meets Beth and they like shake hands, he like won't let go of her hands. And so just all the little nuances that make Ian McKenzie, again, like top five romance heroes ever. Um, gosh, it was great. This week might not be the normal quantity I read, but it is the best quality that I've read, obviously. So... This was fantastic. I don't hear people naysay this book. The people might not love the takeover as much as I do, but I gotta say like I haven't heard many, and maybe they just are quiet because they know how much people love it, but I've not heard many people say a disparaging thing about the madness of Lordy and Mackenzie. In my opinion, it's a perfect historical. Um, my new rating system that I have for my six star books, it gets like a 49 out of 50, <laughs> which is, Pretty cool. Then I reread A Heart of Blood and Ashes. This was a buddy read for the Romance Takeover Readathon. I read this with Crystal, although Crystal is still reading it, but I know she's finally really hooked. Like I had to kind of walk her through a little bit at the beginning because I was like, hi, Crystal. Uh, because I tell people, and so does everyone else who loves this book. Everyone who loves this book, we know that it's gonna take at least 60 to 100 pages for you to get it. And I know most people are like, why would I commit to a book if that's gonna happen? Well, two reasons. One, this is a romantic fantasy and the fantasy is not lacking. Like this isn't just, oh, we're in love, but there's fairies or whatever. Like this is a barbarian fantasy. There's magic, there's dragons, there is evil devil spawn creatures. There is um, evil people who can like mind cast out. Like there is a lot going on. And then we have Maddox, who he comes back from raiding to find out that his mother and father are dead. And he loves his parents. This isn't just a matter of pride. He adores his parents. And even though each time he goes out to fight, they know they might never see each other again, he still is inspecting them to have been stolen from him. And the council that kind of is the peacekeeping council, because they're a bunch of barbarian clans and sometimes they need peacekeepers to keep them from killing each other. Even the council tells him, like, you cannot seek retribution. Your parents did something wrong. This is why they were murdered. And he's like, there's no effing way that my parents went to this kingdom and initiated evil. Like, there's just no way. So then he hears whispers that this king who betrayed him has a daughter. 
and this daughter is about to be married off to another king for peace reasons. And so he, he's like, I'm going to go get this daughter. I'm going to murder her. I'm going to throw her over a wall back into the guy's city just so that he can like feel as bad as I feel. Well, he shows up, meets this woman. Her name is Yvonne, 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 whatever you want to say. I say Yvonne. Um, and she set up being captured because things are not all they seem with Yvonne. She is not a spoiled princess. She is, has been a prisoner of her father. And without getting into many spoilers, she made a last ditch effort to get help from Maddox's parents. And she got caught and it cost Maddox his parents. So that is all true. It technically is Yvonne's fault that his parents were there to be killed, but it's not her fault that they were killed. And there's more going on with this than we know. So that's the setup of this book because then he's gonna kill her and she's like, hey, you're a warrior, I am a queen. If you marry me, I'll make you king. If you give me a child, that child makes me a ruler because that's the rules is like, queens rule her land, but they have to have like an heir in place. There's rules, you know, it's fantasy. And she is like this weak and sickly woman. She's missing some fingers on her hand. She walks funny. She's not that pretty. And Maddox is like, you know that I could like just kill you and take it over. And she's like, but that wouldn't make you king. I make you king. You being with me makes you king. I'm willing to give you that because I hate my father and he's done horrible things. And actually, I know what happened to your mother and father. And, you, and the, the thing that makes this book fascinating, and you'll hear it said on any podcast that talks about it or anything people talk, is that Millivane finds a way to make miscommunication or like unspoken words literally like criminal in this place. Like Maddox people, if you lie or say untruths, that's a death sentence or you are shunned from your community. And so when words come out of Yvonne's mouth that Maddox doesn't believe them, which granted, he has no proof either way. He makes a vow that if you speak of my mother again, I will rip out your tongue. I don't need your tongue to work for your womb to work for me. This is probably my favorite book of the year. It is a dark fantasy romance. It is brilliant. It is something you are committing to. Crystal had to switch over to the audio. She said that helped because otherwise she wouldn't have made it through the rough bits. I struggled through this in the beginning. I've shared it every time I talk about this book. I tried reading this book on my own three different times. And then it wasn't until I heard about it on The Faded Mates. Not when they did their podcast about it, but when Sarah McLean read it as an arc, she talked about a certain scene and I was like that happens I must not have got to that part yet because I don't I hadn't even made it through the second chapter the first three times that I started it but I was like it's so pretty I'll have it and then I got an arc for the second book and then I heard about what happens in this book and I was like okay let's try again and so I pushed myself through it and I was so glad that I did so this time around this time around knowing where we end up it just made it so fantastic and I read through it very quickly I again like was highlighting stuff up the wazoo like I was writing in this book constantly like every word spoken between Maddox and Yvonne is fantastic and so I've read this book I've read the second book the third book doesn't come out until June oh it hurts um but anyway I spend a lot of time talking about this book and I will again because the year's not out yet um so this was obviously a five star and one of my rereads all right, then I took a deviation from my TBR, like I said, to read a couple books. So Crystal sent me this as a get well present from when I had my wisdom teeth out. I had been wanting it and I wanted it in physical form um, just because I like historicals in physical form, even if I listen, like I listen to a lot of historicals. But this one is an anthology of five historical romance things with super sexy stories and they all have a duke that you'd like to F, okay? So there is a story by Sierra Simone, one by Joanna Shoup, Eva Lee, Nicola Davidson, and Adriana Herrera, and they're all about 100 pages. Um, they range the gambit, so I will go through them for you. 
Um, Sierra Simone's story is the chasing of Eleanor Vane. It fits into her historical world, right? Because so, she does have some erotic historical novels. This one is about the girl, Eleanor Vane, who is supposed to marry this Duke's nephew. His name is um, Ajax, um, the Duke of Gerald. And he has a really stupid nephew, but he doesn't want to be a Duke anymore. So he's going to get his nephew married off to this really smart girl. And then he's going to abdicate his dukedom. Um, he has it all set up. Parliament's willing to agree because he is just tired. And then she meets him. She's never met Ajax before. This is a huge age gap. It's a 20-year age gap. And she is head over heels. And there's a serious attraction. And she ends up running away right before the betrothal. And he goes after her. And that's what happens when it happens. Then there is, um, which was the second story of mine, Duke for Hire, I read, which was by Nicola Davidson. This one is about a uh, clergyman's daughter. And her name is Miss Ada Blair. And so she goes to see the Duke of Gilroy and, and asks him to be her first lover. And she's going to pay him a shilling for each sexual act that he does with her. And first he just like kind of laughs at her, but then he thinks she's really pretty and really sweet and so he wants to do it. So they write up a contract, but it's a really funny contract and he is really clear. He's like, you know, this contract doesn't mean anything. Like this is just for us to understand each other. You can say no at any time if we go too far, which was cute because I really like like sex contracts and stuff, but I also like that. He was really clear that this is not binding you can walk away at any moment, obviously. Um, but I love that one. There was toys involved because she wanted to try out toys and things. And so that was incorporated. I love that. I love that in a contemporary when we bring up toys. But for an in a historical, I was, it was great. It was great. And then there is An Education in Pleasure by Eva Lee. And I was telling Crystal, this story, it's my favorite Eva Lee. I've read three of her books so far. We're going to talk about another one in a minute um, to prepare for our live show with her uh, on Thursday, which should be, yeah, because this video is going to go up on Sunday. And this was my favorite one. So this was another age gap, but it's the other way. So this is about Cecilia, who she is a governess to the Duke of Tarrington's younger sisters. So the Duke of Tarrington, he's 21 and his father has just died and he's been away at school for the last five years but these last five years he's been holding a torch for his governess well she wasn't his governess sorry let me be clear she was brought in to be a governess for his younger sisters and he went away to school for his learning so like she was not his teacher so if you're worried about like that power dynamic that didn't exist there was never anything more than like he was really obsessed with her and she is his sexual fantasy so he comes home and that's all like the backstory stuff that gets filled in the initial scene of this is that he comes home and before he can enter his house he like goes for a dip in the pond because he's just so overwhelmed to now be the duke and he really is a cinnamon roll he's an ooey gooey young man who's just really overwhelmed by everything and she catches him in the pond and she sees him and she's like, I shouldn't be having these thoughts. So she's like 30, he's 21. And she's like, I shouldn't be having these thoughts. This man, you know, he's the Duke. Nothing good is going to come of this. She's actually had lovers before. She's had lovers teach her about her body and about pleasure and all these things. And he sees her watching him. And so he gets out of the pond and he's like, I have literally dreamed about you looking at me the way that you're looking at me right now. And I have mostly saved myself because I want you. Would you teach me about pleasure? Whew. So she does. She gives him the, some lessons and she gives him the good ones. Um, but the thing that adds an extra level of amazingness to this is that he's aware of the power dynamic he has. So the power dynamic has shifted from her being a teacher, which again, not his teacher, but like a teaching role, to he's the duke and in charge of her job. So he actually makes his mother in charge of the governess so that he doesn't have any direct power over if she stays or goes. And he tells her, he's like, I don't want you to say yes to anything because I'm the duke. He's very clear about it and it's so sexy. 
because consent is sexy. And if you remove a power dynamic, which I like power dynamics, but if you remove a power dynamic, then it, consent can happen freely and is brilliant. Then there was The Duke Makes Me Feel by Adriana Herrera. This one was my least favorite. It was still like four stars, but the problem was this one had the most interesting plot. So this is a diverse one. This is about Morena Bain Torres, which there's a joke in it about not being able to pronounce the name. I'm sure I didn't, but um, she runs an apothecary and she helps aristocrats. And then this Duke of Lindley comes in and needs her help to do something. And so they end up going on a mini road trip together and then, um, you know, sexy times ensue. However, that this this novella is the one that it should have been a full book. Well, I would have read a full book about any of these because it had too much plot for a novella and therefore the novella like suffered for it, right? Whereas all the rest, I feel like I wanted more of them, but the conflict of the novella fit within a novella. And then the last one was My Dirty Duke, and that was by, by Joanna Shoup. And so this was another age gap. This was a 23-year age gap, and it is an 18-year-old and a, like, 41-year-old, and it's a dad's best friend book. And it was really, really good. And it's one where, like, her dad is kind of like a shitty dad, and I don't know. It was great. So overall, this was a five-star for me. And the lowest rated one was a four star. Otherwise, they were like all five stars. And it was great. And it's funny that like I made the video about Dukes I'd like to F before I read the book. But I'm glad that I waited because Crystal sent me a wonderful gift. And I just had a huge smile on my face the whole time I was reading it. I just adored it. It was great. All right. Then I read Unexpected Turn by Ella Frank. This was an unexpected turn that I read this. But this is one of the books that I got when I did like a a book buying binge on uh, blah, 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 on Kindle. And I actually needed a bit of a palate cleanser from all the historical stuff that I was reading. And I had this um, ebook was only like 99 pages and it's a um, best friend um, gay romance. And it's all takes place over a weekend at a wedding. And the straight friend, he's been having feelings about his friend and like hates his gay friend's boyfriend and the boyfriend can tell that there's something going on even though the gay friend is like what are you talking about we're just besties but it was great this again needed a full book it's supposed to be like the you know the crux of the matter like between all their boiling tension and everything that's going on it just kind of like explodes at this this wedding um and it was fun. I love Ella Frank's like uh, at male male romances and like gay for you romances. And I like I eat that shit up. I don't care. I love it. It was just getting to the point of it. It didn't even have like a sex scene in it, which I'm sorry, but why did I read this then? <laughs> I want some sexy male male time and I didn't get it. So I was a little disappointed with it, but I still gave it four stars because I don't know. It's, it gave me a lot of feelings and it wasn't until I realized it was over that I was like, but, but I want more. So I had to like knock it down a little bit just because I didn't feel satisfied. <laughs> That's really how I am with novellas because I know they only have so much time is I'm like, do I feel satisfied that it's done? And usually I don't, which is why novellas usually get four stars for me. But all right, then I finished my fake rake. This is our pick for the Rake Appreciation Society in December. Again, as I've said, we have the live show is on Crystal's channel, which she's now over a thousand subscribers. So great job, everybody. Congratulations, Crystal. You so deserve it. Um, and we are going to have Eva Lee there with us. So I went in a bit of a rant about, um, not about this book, uh, but about you know being honest to authors and like not getting in their face about things. And then the other way about authors not being disrespectful to reviewers because we're allowed to feel whatever we feel. That is like something that I try to be cognizant of because I do start having authors comment on things that I post now. Not like, but like I'm always careful that if I ever tag an author in something that it's either very complimentary 
or is just a post about like, I'm starting your book or I've done a pretty photo layout of your book or something like that. I never take an author in a negative review. I never shove it in their face because that's just cruel. Like this person put time into a book and I didn't love it. So that being said, like I didn't love this and I'm nervous about a live show where I'm like, okay, how are we going to do this? However, I'm really excited to talk to an author who's done something that I'm not talented enough to do, which is write many, many books. And to make it in this industry, I think is fantastic. The things I didn't like about this, this is a cinnamon roll hero. He's delicious. He's a delicious cinnamon roll. Um, this is a heroine who is, they're both bookish. They're both nerdy. She has an interesting career. But here's the thing. I like cinnamon rolls. I've made a video about it. A lot of people don't know what cinnamon roll is. But cinnamon roll does not mean passive. Being like that's weak. And there's nothing wrong with like being weak, but I don't want to read about you. Like I don't want to read about you if you're weak. And my problem with Sebastian at the end of the day is that he is so afraid of not rocking the boat and not claiming what he wants that the choices he's making are hurting his love. Like they are hurting Grace when he's trying to be so kind and so whatever you want, whatever you need. There comes a point in this book where he's hurting her with every decision that he makes. And specifically one after their first love scene together where Crystal would say uh, he white fangs her. <laughs> I would say he is just so worried about having went over the line that he completely just backs way up off of it and like runs in the other direction and it's very hurtful to the heroine and I he just couldn't come back from that for me and so I see what people are saying they're like he's very respectful he's so kind and like I enjoyed all that but I was bored at the end of the day because Sebastian not at any point in this book did he state what he wanted and some people might like that. They're like, oh, it was completely up to the heroine. But I was like, well, also the heroine's not doing a great job either. Because Grace, for all of this being about woman power, she never once said what she wanted until the last second either. So then you just end up with two characters who are so pleasing to each other that neither of them says what they want and they're about to ruin their lives. And that's the kind of miscommunication that lights up my angry lights where I'm like, you guys, I don't even want you to be together. So that's something that I said is I was like, they were so cute and they had me and I was here for it. And then after that scene where that goes down, I was like, I don't even care if you end up together because your cuteness is done for me. So that was really hard to get to. So I gave my fake rake three stars because the more I talked about it, the more I was like, there's too much in this book that like, I wouldn't recommend this book. There's going to be a ton of people who will. And I'm not saying they're wrong because their reasons for loving this book are different than mine. But I know that there's nothing about this couple that got me excited, that I wanted to revisit them, that I even cared if they ended up together. I was like, okay, if you can figure it out, that's great. But I don't care. And if I don't care about you as a couple, what's the point of your book to me? So that's a harsh truth but it's the truth. All right, so then I read Hot and Bothered by L. Kennedy. This is a uh, out of uniform bind up. So yes, there's nine of these and they're in like different groups. And I had heard about this from the Menage episode of Faded Mates because one of these three had a Menage in it. I think later ones will too. But dude, I ended up giving this a 2.5 stars. I don't wanna talk about it anymore. It was boring and lame. For being a sexy book, I was like, what are you doing? And also, also, so I listened to this on audio because I bought the book and then the audio upgrade was only $1.99. So I was like, I'll take it. The second narrator was the most annoying male narrator I've ever listened to. And you know that thing where like, you have a really sexy book and these are like read by males, which I love when I get a romance novel read by a guy. I honestly wish most of them were <laughs> because I'm like, what am I getting the most pleasure out of? And it's hearing a guy read this to me. But he had a voice where he talked like this and then each thing he said like ended on an accent. So we're having a sex scene and he's like, I was eating her pussy. And he's talking like that. And I'm like, that's not sexy. 
Like, what are you reading, bro? You're not reading like the Sunday Times here. But then the guy who read books one and three, he just had this really steamy, smoldery voice. And I was still bored. So 2.5 stars for that. And then I realized I was going to talk about this book because I need to rant a little bit about this book. Not about the book, because this book, it's one of my rereads, and it's perfect. That's Mine Till Midnight by Lisa Claypez. Um, this is the first book in the Hathaway series. This has a um, Amelia Hathaway, who's the oldest sister in the Hathaway family. After a reread, I realized I've been saying that she's the oldest Hathaway because at one point in the book, she says she's the oldest sober Hathaway. Leo is the oldest, um, but I forgot about that because Amelia acts like the oldest. But Amelia's trying to keep her family together because they've inherited an estate, but her brother, who's the heir, he is in a deep depression after losing his loved one. He had a fiance who was actually Amelia's best friend. Like we forget, I've forgotten that, um, that they're best friends. And so she, in the beginning of this book, she goes to London to find her brother and he's at Jenner's, um, which is run by St. Vincent from the Wallflower series and Cam who, Cam Rohan, who is a half Irish, half Rome, um, uh, game master, like he works there. And they have this instant chemistry that's just gut-wrenching. Like, it's so sexy, so great. And I love this book. This book is five out of five stars. The construction is starting. I didn't wake up early enough. Um, so let's put that down. The biggest issue, and I forgot that one of my viewers told me about this. I think it was Kathleen. I could be wrong, but I think Kathleen told me about this a long time ago. Like at the beginning of the year when I read the book the first time, she told me that she had listened to them on audio because they had put out revised audiobooks for the series. But in the revision, they completely changed some stuff. So I think a lot of people thought that the revision would just be to change some of the language because there is some language in it that is a bit like insensitive these days. Um, from when it was written, because these were written like 14 years ago. So it's fair that we would need to change some things. However, that's not the only thing that was changed. Like they didn't just go through and update the language so that we weren't using like the term gypsy or any other hurtful terms. That was what I think people thought the change was supposed to be. They literally watered down sex scenes and changed the order of things on a page. And I wouldn't have noticed it. Like I totally forgot about it. I knew that she'd said that about a, a clay pass book, but I thought it was like dreaming of you or one of those, which I'd already read, but no, I didn't notice it during the work day because I was listening to this book while I'm working. And then what I like to do is I've said many times is when I have the time, I will read the book and listen at the same time. Cause it is the most immersive, wonderful reading experience. And I'm reading along in the bath, having a bath. And I'm like, Oh, I'm going to, Listen, and there's just like the pages are just messed up and there's chunks cut out and sex scenes are watered down and Cam is made to be like less sexually aggressive. He's, he's my perfect alpha hero. Like, so I realized then as I was like, wow, they are tainting my reading experience. So I had to put the audio down and go to reading it physically, which I have like 30 pages left, which I'm going to finish today. So I'm putting it in this wrap up. But badly done, whoever readed the audio for this, because why, like, it's one thing if you're changing, like, terms so that you aren't being offensive or insensitive, but to change the content of a book that is, like, my favorite book because you think the hero is, like, being too aggressive. And I'm like, it's Cam fucking Rohan. He's perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. He's one of the swooniest heroes in historical romance. He's delicious. He's on Derek Craven level. He's my favorite Lisa Claypez hero. Why would you water it down? It didn't need it. It was ruining things. And it wasn't just sex scenes. There were just parts of the book where we'd rearrange things. So I don't know if it was like, I assume Lisa was consulted about this. And I don't know if there were things she wanted to revise. And she just like changed them. But why? But why? So I was pretty pissed off last night and I was like, okay, I'm not going to take this out on my favorite book. But once I realized that happened, I was like, well, which things was I reading differently 
that I didn't even know that I was because I was just listening to it on this reread until I picked up the book. So I'm pretty pissed about that. And I just wanted to let you know, in case you prefer to listen to audio, if you listen till mine till midnight, please read the book. If not alongside it, read the book over listening to it because looking back through, because then I went back to some scenes and they've just changed stuff. And I was like, why? I liked him as he was. I didn't need you to change him for me. Uh, I was annoyed. So there's a little bit of a rant. But anyway, all right. So these are the books that I read the first week of December. Um, I hope that the uh, romantic of a readathon is going well for you. I'm having a great time. Um, I just, oh, I'm enjoying this readathon so much. I'm trying to put up as many vlogs throughout it as I can. Um, a lot of fun stuff coming up this week. Make sure you check out our live show. I know, again, I didn't say great things about my fake rake, but I've read a few of Eva's other books just in case I didn't like my fake rake. I purposely was like, well, I'm going to read some of her other books because to pin all my hopes on one author is kind of a lot. Also, you might want to show up at the live show because we have some great things to announce. So you might want to show up because we have some. We're going to be announcing both January and February reads. And we're very, very excited about those. Ooh, me and Crystal are really excited. So thank you so much for watching this. I put up new videos multiple times a week. Make sure you check out channel subscriptions, subscribe, channel memberships, subscribe and like this video. It really helps me in the ever knowing YouTube algorithm, ever changing. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.